part of the premise of the, the books and the television series is the fact that there are the, these entirely unpredictable seasons uh, and obviously it clearly matters to everybody economically, politically and just in terms of survival, knowing when winter's coming. Winter is coming. It is not. It is not. So yes, no, they're variable in duration, so the seasons, they're unpredictable when they'll come and how long they're going to last for is completely unpredictable. There are two aspects to it. The main aspect to seasons on our planet is to do with the tilt of the Earth's axis. And when the Earth's axis is tilted towards the sun in the hemisphere you happen to be, whether that's north or south, then you're in summer. And obviously as the Earth goes around the sun, one part of the year you're leaning towards the sun, you have summer, part of the year you're leaning away from the sun, then you have winter. That's the main aspect, then there's a slight secondary aspect, which is that the Earth's orbit is not exactly circular, and when the Earth is, uh, is closer to the Sun, it's a little bit warmer, when it's further away, it's a little bit colder. And that actually, the point when you're closest to the Sun actually occurs in January, um, and that's why summers in the Southern Hemisphere, which obviously are in full swing in January, are a little warmer than summers in the Northern Hemisphere. So on Westeros, on the, the planet where Westeros is, you have these entirely unpredictable seasons, which means it must be something much more complicated is going on. And obviously, you know, we're talking about a fictional world here, so if you want, it can just be magic. Uh, but it would be nice to try and figure out if there can actually be a, some sort of scientific explanation as to what's going on. You know nothing, Jon Snow. Geographically, if you have features on your planet, they can actually have a, a, a strong impact on the climate of the planet. For example, um, you could have some fairly narrow seaway through which some important stream of warm water was traveling, which was keeping your planet reasonably warm. And so then if that fairly narrow passageway froze up, that would then cut off the supply of warm water, and then you get into this kind of positive feedback thing. And actually, that's a very common feature of these chaotic systems. It can be a long time before it could then uh, thaws out again and you can start the next summer season. So another terrestrial thing that could be responsible for it is if you had a periodic volcanic eruptions, because we know that actually volcanoes on the Earth, when they throw large amounts of dust into the atmosphere, that can actually have a, an effect on the temperature. And so you could imagine a rather strange planet in which the seasons were dictated by whether or not there had been a recent volcanic eruption. That once there were two moons in the sky, but one wandered too close to the sun and it cracked. Okay, so moving on to possible astronomical explanations. As I said, the tilt of the, of the axis of a planet is, at least in the case of the Earth, a thing that's responsible for the, the the seasons, and you could imagine if that tilt were actually wobbling around a place, then that would mean that the seasons would change in a really rather strange and unpredictable kind of way. And in fact, when we study the, the angles at which the uh, axes of the planets in the solar system are oriented, they do actually vary over time. The Earth famously does, but actually all the other planets do as well. And they actually do it in this chaotic way. They actually move around in a way which is very hard to predict. And so you could imagine that seasons are being driven by a planet in which that axis is tilting around very rapidly. The reason why this probably doesn't work is that if you think about it, you've got this spinning planet. What you've got to do is reorient that entire spin. So you've actually changed from a spin planet that's spinning like this to a planet that's spinning over like that. That's a huge amount of angular momentum. You've got to get shifted somewhere. So it has to be some interaction with some other body in the, in, in the, the stellar system in which this thing lives, the planetary system in which it lives, and transferring that amount of, of angular momentum. And we have to do this on a time scale of just a few years because we want the winters to be lasting a year or two years or ten years. So those kind of time scales, it probably doesn't work. But at least in theory, that's a way of, of getting seasons to change in a rather unpredictable way. There's great honour serving at the Night's Watch. The Starks have manned the wall for thousands of years. If you have a very elliptical orbit, indeed, when the thing's close to the star it's orbiting, it'll be nice and warm, and then when it goes away, it'll get very cold. But the trouble with that is that that's entirely predictable, because the thing orbits around, you know, once per year. The year's length don't change. Kepler's laws keep it going around on a nice elliptical orbit. So if that were all that was going on, you wouldn't have... You might have seasons which were dictated by the distance, but actually those seasons wouldn't move around. They wouldn't vary in length from one year to the next. <laughs> So what you need to do is come up with some way of messing with the orbit, making it so it's not just a normal ellipse. And the way you do that, well, you would get an ellipse when you have a planet that's going around one star. But if you had a binary star, two stars, and you put a planet in orbit around it, then the orbits get much more complicated, and you can have, again, you can have chaos setting in, and you can have the, the, the average distance between that particular planet and the stars will vary over time in a really rather complicated way. And again, that can lead to very unpredictable seasons. Professor, you get the feeling that if there were two suns blazing over Westeros, it would have come up in the books at some point. You would think it would get a mention somewhere along the line, which means that probably if there is a second star, it has to be very faint. 
And then, because then you would probably only reference the big star in the sky, the, the, your sun. Um, and if you had a second object, it could be a white dwarf star or maybe even a neutron star or one of these things called a brown dwarf, which wasn't quite massive enough to form, you know, start the nuclear fusion processes and really become a bright star itself. Then perhaps that's what's going on. And so they don't bother to mention it in the books because it's there, but it's just not that worthy of mention. It's not the thing that keeps you warm. My dreams are different. Mine are true. One of the ways that's completely different from here on Earth of making seasons vary, making the average temperature of your, your planet vary, is by making the brightness of the star that you're orbiting around vary with time. And again, one of the nice things about this is that there are indeed variable stars out there. And actually, some of these variable stars do indeed display this phenomenon of chaos, that some of them vary in a very predictable way, but some of them vary really in completely unpredictable ways. And so that could be a very nice way of making seasons be completely unpredictable, that sometimes your star gets a little bit brighter and that warms everything up, sometimes it gets a little bit fainter and that cools everything down. Um, and that would sort of meet the bill rather nicely because it, it is completely unpredictable, it hasn't introduced any new physics along the way, and it's a way yeah, of actually making the seasons sort of come and go in a way that you really wouldn't be able to predict ahead of time. There's a longer version of this interview with Professor Merrifield also online that includes more about how planets move around binary stars, more about variable stars, an academic paper written about Game of Thrones astronomy, and also a little bit about the TV show's opening sequence and things called Dyson Spheres. So check that out. It's on our astronomy channel, Deep Sky Videos. I'll have a link on the screen, link in the video description. And if you haven't heard of Deep Sky Videos, well that's another channel you should have subscribed to by now.